Hi, everybody. Okay, so tonight we are up to the fourth principle. It actually worked out really nice. I don't know, it do usually doesn't work out that we have six classes, but this time it did. So we have six classes for six constant mitzvahs. Let's see who remembers the first three. Relationship with God. Right, right, knowing God, okay? The first one is knowing that there's a God. Number two is there is only one God, knowing that he's one. Number three is? Wait, second, two is like idol worship, so there is no other God. Good. And number three was, what was last week? Believing, Believing that everything, he is whole, he's complete. Yichud Hashem, the oneness of Hashem. So number one, we had to know that there's a God. Number two, we believe in him and no other. And number three was that he is one. And then we spoke about the idea that everything that he does is really one. It's, there's no good guy, there's no bad guy, right? Okay. Um, so the fourth principle in God's awareness is loving God. So really, the cornerstone of every relationship is love, okay? So it makes sense that one of the principles of getting to know your God is to love him, okay? But how do we create love? And the truth is, if we're asking how do we create love with God, how do we really create love with anybody? Any relationship that we have, how do we create love? So our problem is that we have a big problem, that our world is completely adulterated by the values of other cultures. And for some reason, Western, Greek, Roman concepts on love, of relationships, just like rolled into our world like a wave on the beach, right? So they are not necessarily accepted within our Jewish world, and it's a very big problem because now our views of love and romance are totally skewed. So you know that I love to give my speech on love and relationships, so we're going to touch on that a little bit um, because it's a very important area for us to understand because if we want to understand how to build a relationship with God, we need to have to be able to understand how to build relationships down here. So now there's a very famous story in the Talmud that some of you may have heard. It's a little gory, I'm going to warn you, okay? Um, but just bear with me because there's a really, really important lesson in the Torah. Okay, so once upon a time, I love stories, I love history, okay? <laughs> once upon a time, the Romans made a decree um, that all of Judaism is forbidden, and the death penalty specifically was attached to the learning of Torah, okay? So you can't be Jewish, and specifically, you can study the Torah. And shortly after this decree, the curtain opens up on the scene, and we have a very famous rabbi standing there. His name is Rabbi Akiva. Okay, everybody heard of Rabbi Akiva? Akiva, he's standing there, he's in Times Square, and he's yelling. He's like, come, come, let's learn Torah. So he's like gathering the masses, right? Remember the decree just went up, right? That was like the prologue, is that what it's called? Right, the beginning of it, okay? So all the people are gathering around, and Akiva's like, come, come, let's learn Torah. And sitting there on the sidelines is a secularized Jew. His name is... Papas ben Yehuda, okay? Papas, the son of Yehuda, okay? So he's sitting there, and he looks at him, and he says, Akiva, what are you doing? What do you think you're doing right now? And he looks at him, and Akiva looks at him, and he's like, how can I explain this to you? What can our situation be compared to? So he gives him a little parable, and he says, we're like a bunch of fish, okay, darting around the water. And there's a fox that walks by, and he looks down at the fish, and he says, fish? What are you running away from? And the fish look up to the fox and they say, well, you know, we're, we're darting around. We're, we're trying to get out of the way of the net that's trying to catch us. And we're trying to get away from the sharks and the bigger fish that want to eat us. So the fox looks down at him and he says, well, fish, um, why don't you, like, right, smacking his lips, why don't you come out here and live on the land with me? And, and you could be with, like, just like your ancestors lived with me. Why don't you... Come out here with me. And the fish look at him and they say, a fox, you're, I, I'm totally not actress. But I'm like, I try to like smack my lips like a fox would, but, <laughs> and he, the, the fish look up at the fox and they say, you're the animal that they call the slyest of all? You're the smartest? You're a fool. If we could barely make it here in the water, we will surely die when we come out of the water. This is the example that Rabbi Akiva gives him. So he tells him a few moments later, the Romans show up, they grab Akiva, they bind him, they drag him into a jail cell, they pull him in there. So you can imagine the scene, like Akiva sitting there in jail and he hears banging sounds. What are they doing? The Romans are building this torture table to torture Rabbi Akiva for learning Torah. 
and all of a sudden he hears somebody being dragged down the hallway. And all of a sudden they open up his, gel, his, his cell and they throw in Papa's Ben Yehuda. And he looks at him, he says, Papa's, what are you doing here? You didn't do anything wrong. And Papa's looks at him and he says, how fortunate are you that you at least are being tortured and you're being thrown into jail for studying Torah. Me? They just threw me in here because, because I was standing there, just because I'm a Jew. How fortunate are you? And then the banging continues. And all of a sudden, they open up his cell. They grab Akiva. I mean, you could just imagine the scene. Thousands of his students and all the Jewish people watching him. And, and, and like, I know this is gory, but like, this is, this is the story that Talmud says. They, they bind Akiva, and they take out this instrument that they call Masrego Shar Barzel, which is the way the Talmud describes it sounds like a, a giant potato peeler. I mean, there's no other way to explain it. And they start to comb his skin. They start out with his feet, and they go all the way up his body. And this is, this is what's going on in front of all the Jewish people at the time. This is before the destruction of the, after the destruction of the Second Temple. And he starts to scream out in pain, and everybody's watching him. And they come up to his face, and they come up, it actually says, to the point right above his mouth. And he makes some kind of motion that he, he wants to say something. And what do we know? What do Jewish people say right before their death? He wants to say the Shema. He wants to say the Shema. And he asks them to stop. And his students come around. They say, Akiva, what are you doing? How can you pray to God now? How can you even say the Shema? And he looks at them and he says, my students, he says, my whole life I've been waiting for this opportunity to fulfill the mitzvah of v'yahavta es Hashem alokecha bechol levavcha, that you shall love God, your Lord, with all your soul, even when they're taking your soul. And now I have the opportunity, and I don't fulfill it with love, with happiness. This is my moment. And he starts to say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. And it says his soul left his body when the word Echad God's oneness, right, which we spoke about last week, that was on his lips. It says his soul left his body. So that's the story. Very dramatic, movie scene, right? Like who could play Akiva, right? We hear the story as a kid. When you hear it, it's like, oh, well, that's the story of Rabbi Akiva. But if you start to think about it, there's, there's nothing that makes sense here, nothing. And here, this is what, is, this is what happens. Before the scene, as the scene is closing, as his soul is going up, a voice comes out from heaven. The angels say, Zu Torah, the Zu Torah, this is Torah, and this is its reward? The angels are screaming at God. They're saying, Hashem, this is Torah? <coughs> this is a guy, Rabbi Akiva, who at the age of 40 began to learn the Torah. He began to knock his head on wood, okay? He had nothing there. He began studying Torah when he was 40 years old. He grew, he got married, he became a rab, he became the greatest of the greatest. 12 years, he had 12,000 students. After another 12 years, 24 years, he amassed 24,000 students. Zu Torah, the Zeus Torah, this is Torah? This is its reward? And then it says, a voice came out from heaven, a baskol, which is like the voice, it says, of a, of a child, a baskol, a voice from God comes down, it says, how fortunate is Rabbi Akiva for he has been accepted to the highest place in heaven, and he has a seat right next to God. How fortunate. Okay, let's start attacking this. To me, this looks like suicide. He goes out there. He knows there's a decree. He's gathering the Jewish people to come study Torah. This is suicide. And for a nation... By the way, the Jewish people, we know we look, very, we look down upon suicide, right? A religion that's so rooted in the love of life, how can we have a martyr like this? He's a hero, by the way. Rabbi Akiva is known as the hero. He is like the hero. This story makes him a hero. He's Mr. Ahava, Mr. Love, for this story. So for a nation, so for a religion, so rooted in the love of life, what is going on here in this story? It says that God created this world for one reason and one reason only, to love us. He created us because he loves us. Now, we are meant to be, by the way, the objects of God's affection. Like, that is why we are here in this world. And he, because he wants to give us the ultimate gift of his affection, he wants us to feel it, 
What does he do? We spoke about this several times. He wants us to earn our right on this world, right? That's the whole reason why he doesn't show up at our front doorstep in the beginning, right? We spoke about this the first time when we want to build a relationship with him. God wants us to earn it in this world so that comes to the next world and we can have a seat right next to him. So that's the idea. We want to build ourselves up. We want to appreciate it. And later on, we try to become, we want to become more godlike. We want to become merciful, right? It's a back and forth relationship between us and God. So just as God is someone who's a lover, right? He created this world because he loves us and we are the objects of his affection. So too, our job down here is to become lovers and givers. I love that. Lovers and givers, right? That's what we're here for. That's what we're meant to be. Our entire purpose in this world is to love and become close to God. That is our purpose in this world. The entire purpose that we're here is for intimacy, for relationships, to build relationships, bottom line. That's it. So there's like probably like two reasons why you didn't just fall off your chair right now. So either number one, somebody told you that before, maybe Zalman spoke about that before, or we just don't understand what that statement means, that we are here to be loved and to love. Now, some of these reasons is that because, so really I think it's because I don't appreciate, I mean, this is me, nobody taught me this before, but I, I mean, people have spoken to me this before, but I just don't appreciate the following statement that we are here to do that. So we have this misconstrued view of love in this world and what it means to actually be a lover and a giver. There's a famous story that happened with a rabbi. Always happened with a rabbi. It didn't happen in a bar, though. It happened, <laughs> it actually happened at a seminary, okay? So this woman goes over to this rabbi and, uh, like a woman's seminary, not like a church seminary. Um, a girl's seminary, a woman goes up to the rabbi and she tells him, and actually I know this rabbi very well because he was my teacher, um, when I was in Israel, and he goes up to the rabbi and he says, you know, tomorrow I'm going back to America and I'm going to have a surgery where I'm going to tie my tube so that I make sure that I never have any more children. I never have children. And he's like, okay, um, is there a reason that you feel like this? What happened in your childhood? Right, like, what's going on? And she starts to tell him, she's like, there's so much hunger. There's so much sickness. There's no money. How are we going to bring children to this world? This is the scariest world. We live in the worst of times. Why would I bring children into this world? So my rabbi's like thinking, and he's like, what am I going to tell this crazy woman? So he gives her a parable, which is always very great, right? Love parables, an example. So he tells a story about this, about this guy who wants to go to medical school, okay? He, we know he wakes up one day when he's five years old, I'm going to be a doctor, right? Like they always tell you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Ozzy wants to be a fireman. I'm not, and then he actually asked me, he's like, do firemen go to yeshiva? I'm like, yeah, yeah it's okay. Because he wants to make sure that like, he could fit fireman like, after like, he finishes yeshiva, he wants to go be a fireman. So this, so this guy wants to be a doctor, right? This guy, this kid wants to be a doctor his whole life. This is what I want to be. He goes through high school. All his friends are partying in high school, like worrying about who they're <laughs> going to take to the prom. He's like, I am going to study. I am going to make it. I know what I want to be. I want to be a doctor. I'm going to get the best grade so I can get a good scholarship, so I can go to a good college. Every year, starts as a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, graduates, top of his class, makes it to the college that he wants to, right? I don't know, good college, tell me something. Harvard. What? Harvard. He gets into Harvard, and he's like, I made it to Harvard, gets to Harvard, and he finds out that his whole class is a bunch of him, right? Like a bunch of guys who really, really wanted to make it, worked so hard, and now he's like, oh my gosh, now I have to work even harder. So, you know, first year of college, it's a little rough. He didn't realize how much he's going to have to study. All his friends are out getting drunk, partying, girls, guys, this, that, partying all day. I am going to do this. He sits in his dorm, and he's studying, and he's working so hard. First year, second year, third year, pushing himself so, so, so hard gets into Harvard Medical School. He made it. He is working so hard. Another four years, residency. I don't even know what goes on in medical school. I'm going to pretend, but it's really, 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 really hard. And he makes his way up. And he is now the top surgeon at Harvard's emergency room, if they have one. Comes in the first day, right? Like, you're like Grey's Anatomy. Like, I have it in my head. Like, if I want it, I can be a doctor because I know, I know all the terminology, right? Thank you. So he's like putting on his scrubs, he's getting ready to go in his whole life has brought him to this point. This is why he's here in this world. I am going to save people. And he gets his way and as he's about to walk into the double doors, right, open up those doors of the hospital, a woman comes out screaming, don't go in there, please, it's a nightmare. 
There's blood everywhere. There's limbs hanging. Don't go in there. And then he looks at her and he says, what are you talking about? It's a nightmare? This is my dream. This is my dream. This is what I waited for my whole life. If you came into this world as a taker, of course it's a nightmare. Of course you're not going to have enough money, not enough food. There's sickness. Everyone, people are dying. Of course if you came into this world as a taker, there's nothing for you to, do, nothing for you to gain. But if you came here to give, it's a dream. I open up those doors. I've been waiting my whole life for this. And my rabbi said that a year and a half later, he got a postcard from the woman with a baby, a picture of a baby. He's like, I'd love to say that she had another 10 more, but all I know is that she had that one baby. If you came here in this world to give, there's so much for you to do. And now here is where the, the rest of the world has this, un, has this totally wrong view of love. Because if you would pull somebody aside on the street, right, and be like, do you love him? Do you love him? Do you love him? So she's going to be like, okay, I know what you're talking about. Let me start thinking. So what does he do for me? Do I love him, right? Does he, does he take out the trash? Does he help me with the, does he buy me flowers? Does he make me happy? Does he take me to the movie that I want to see? That I, 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 me, 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 right? Everything about me. Does he make me happy? But if you pull aside somebody who has the real meaning of love and says, do you love him? Do you love him? And what does she start thinking? The, one, the woman with the right views, right? Who has her head screwed on right. What does she think? She says, wait, what do I give to him? What, does, what do I give to him that makes me a better person? All of a sudden, the conversation goes from me, 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 to does he make me happy? How much am I willing to give up for this person? That's how much I love them. If I'm willing to give up my time or something from me, right, like, okay, so if I'm not like, oh, I have such a headache, Oh, man, I think I have such a headache, right? So men, when they get sick, the world comes to an end. And he's like, oh, man, I have such a headache. And I'm like, okay, is it, real? is it real? Is it a really bad headache? He's like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, so you know what? I'll get you Tylenol. Okay. Go upstairs, I get a Tylenol, take it out of the cabinet. And he's like, mm, it's not going to do it. I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe I need like a, like a, like a cold drink. And I'm like, okay, how much am I willing to go out of my way to make him feel better? So, yes go out and I get the cold drink. Oh, oh, it's not cold enough. I was like, oh, and now you're pushing it, uh -huh. right? And then he's like, I, you know what? I, I think I have to go to the doctor, but I don't think I can drive. Okay, okay, get in the car. Don't worry. I'll get a babysitter. Get in the car. I'll drive you to the doctor. Get to the doctor. I mean, I, I don't want to say it enough because I don't want it to be like my husband, but at some point someone needs a blood, trans blood transfusion or somebody needs a kidney. How much am I willing to give from myself to you because I love you? That is love. Not me, 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 right? And we live in this world where everything is I, right? Like iPod, I touch, everything is I. We don't even realize it's like into our subconscious. And then I heard this rabbi saying when he finally heard about a we, he's like, oh, I got to go get that. What is it? And then he goes, and I see it, and it's W-I-I. -I. <laughs> and he's like, oh, everything is I, and it's not. It's supposed to be, how much am I willing to give up from me for him? So we have this like in our vocabulary and it's completely adulterating our world. And like, and I, I can't say this enough, but like now we have these like ridiculous books, like Fifty Shades of Grey, I did not read it. But I'm like, that is what the world views as love. How crazy is that? How am I supposed to build relationships when that's around me? I don't know, I didn't read it. I heard there's a big movie coming out and like, what is that? What kind of world do we live in? Really? Is that love? That, that's what love is? I'm sorry if I'm embarrassing if anybody read it. It's a really good book because I used to make fun of everybody when they read Hunger Games until I finally read it. But when love, when, I'm sorry, when love is, is letting go of yourself for somebody else, then it like changes like your whole vocabulary. If you think about it in a marriage, wait, what do people think about a marriage? I'll take out the garbage, you do the dishes, I'll go to work, you take care of the kids, right? It's like this mutually parasitic relationship. It's like, I'll give my 50, you give your 50. That's wonderful. As soon as somebody breaks the contract or forgets to do their job, okay, that's okay. It's okay. If it's a business relationship, if I didn't give my part, then it's okay. 
We, we could just like stop this right now. That's literally what it's become. It's become this business kind of relationship. But at some point, like, so things are not working out. It's a contract. It's okay. There is no Hebrew word for marriage, by the way. The Hebrew word for marriage is nisuin. Okay, first there's kiddushin, okay, where it, well, that means holiness. And then the Hebrew word for marriage is nisuin. If you look on, like, Hebrew benchers, it says simchas nisuin. The wet, what is nisuin? What does nus, nisuin come from, the Hebrew word? It comes from the Hebrew word of nose, which means to carry, which means no matter how heavy you get, I will carry you. No matter how much your burdens weigh me down, I will be there to carry you. That is real marriage. That means I'm willing to give up all of myself for you, right? People, my friends complain all the time. Maybe I do it also. My husband's never home. I do everything. I take out the garbage. I do this. I go to work also. And I'm like, you only care about yourself. Of course you're not going to see this. A real marriage should be, I'll do everything, unless you don't want me to, right, okay? But otherwise, I'll do everything that will make you happy because I love you. So this word love is starting to give you a different, it's starting to give you like a different view of like how we really see relationships. So let's go back to Rabbi Akiva a second. Papa's Ben Yehuda, what is he doing? What is he saying? What is that second Jew, Jew saying? He's saying, Akiva, what are you doing? Why are you going up there and announcing for everyone to come here? What are you doing? What are you going to get out of this? What benefit does this have for you? That's exactly what he was telling him, standing there, gathering the masses. And what does he tell him? He's really telling him, Akiva, this is going to hurt a lot. Are you willing to do that? Are you? What are you thinking, Akiva? What is going through your mind? And then he starts to tell him, Akiva looks at him and he says, he starts to say the story of the fish, right? Fish and water. Water is always a metaphor for Torah, by the way. Always. Because like it says you look into the water and you see yourself, you see reflection back in the days before you had mirrors. Oh, by the way, I try to download a mirror for my iPhone. And it basically, well, all they do is they give you your camera. You know when your camera, you can face your camera the other way. I'm like, oh, that's a mirror. That's them. But it used to be, before they had mirrors, sorry, people would look look into the water and see themselves. So it says that you look into the Torah and you see your reflection, you see who you really are, your essence. So t water is always a metaphor for Torah. You can't live without water, you can't live without Torah. Right, so what is Akiva telling you? Akiva's like, you think life is about a two-car garage, a trip to the Poconos, right, uh, a wonderful happy marriage, a ski vacation once in a while. That's what you think life is about, right? If you think that's what life is about, how can I explain this to you? I have no other way to explain this to you than tell you the story about the fish in the sea. Life is indicated by the level of ahava you are experiencing. Think about ahava is love, right? Ava means really to give. It comes from the root of have, to give. So it's saying, if you, if you just think about it for a second, everybody had somebody that they loved at some point that is no longer with them. If you just think about that person, what do you experience? You feel death when they're not with you. That's really what it is. Akiva is telling him, I can't explain this to you. If I come out of the water, if I come out of the Torah, out of my relationship with Hashem, I will for sure be dead. If you don't have that person with you, <coughs> that person who fills your mind at every single moment, every, every, muse, every sound of music you hear makes you think of them, that is what Akiva was experiencing, the ultimate level of love, of all I want to do is buy you flowers, even if you don't want it, even if you don't expect it. All I want to do is surprise you and show you I care for you. That is how I feel with Hashem. That is what I want to tell you. And if I'm without it, I am dead. That is my level. So Akiva, he gets arrested. He gets thrown onto this platform. And Akiva knows something that not everybody else around him knows. He knows he's going to die at that moment. He knows he had the opportunity. Now, most people, you know, when they know that, when they, most people know this. And when I give to you, it feels good. It feels good to give, right? I love to give. I'm like my grandmother. I'm always walking around with stuff to give people, like little things, like little cards, little notes. I like to give. Why? Because it makes me feel good. <laughs> I mean, maybe it makes you feel good, also, but it also makes me feel good. I love to bake. I just bake challah for my whole office, walking around in the public school in the Bronx, giving out challah. It just feels good, right? And then there's like this one, one black woman I work with. She's like, oh, that's the bread they give it up on mitzvahs. <laughs> she's like, oh, I love that bread. Give me some holly. And I'm like, 
yes, it's nice, but I'm like, it feels so good to give, right? You do. You know that feeling because it, it feels to give. But what Akiva doesn't real, what most people don't realize is that the more you give, when you give, you create love. You create Ava. Yes, it feels good, but you create this relationship. And eventually, you raise this level of love, of Ava, so high that there is nothing in the way. Nothing. Nothing can stop me from loving this person. And Akiva, he pushed it to the edge, to the highest level. He is, by the way, the symbol of Ahava in the Torah. He is the absolute symbol of love. Like I said, he is Mr. Ahava, okay? Step after step, he kept giving and giving and giving to Hashem that he rose to such a high level, he pushed the level of love until he pinned it. He's like, there's one last level of love that I can't give, and that is the Chol Nafshacha, with all my soul. Now, by the way, I just want to tell you that this is this example is extreme. Nobody should ever have to be in the situation where they have to give up their life for God. I mean, people in the Holocaust, yes, they were faced with it. But nowadays, no, don't think that this is what we should be doing. We shouldn't be going out and like committing suicide. That's not the idea. But he was on such a level where he can reach anything he wanted to. He kept raising his level of love for Hashem so high that when the moment came for him to fulfill it, he grabbed it. It's like, I don't have any other choice but to fulfill this mitzvah right now, here and then. And that's why he started calling people. He's like, come, learn Torah. This is going to happen. I'm going to make it. I am going to make it to where I want it to reach my whole life. Come, learn Torah. And the students, they come around, and they're watching him being tortured. And they're asking him, Akiva, what are you saying the Shema for? Who do you think you are? What are you doing? And he sings, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. And the angels say, Zu Torah, Zu Torah, this is Torah? You're joking me. This is its reward? And the Talmud tells us, no, you're reading it wrong. It's all. Oh, this is Torah. Oh, this is the reward you get for serving God and keeping the Torah. What are we talking about? What are the angels saying, Zu Torah, Zu Torah? They're saying, for practicing love like no person's ever loved before, God gave him the opportunity to do what he wanted to do. If all you want to do in this world is to give and love, Hashem will give you the opportunity to fulfill it. Think about that woman. She was saying, oh, I can't bring children into this world. If all you want to do is love, Hashem will give you that opportunity. And Akiva kept going higher and higher and higher. If all you want to do is love and give to fulfill the purpose of this universe, of to be lovers and givers, right? That is our purpose here in this world, to be lovers and givers. If all you want to do, you just let go of everything. And you tell Hashem, give me the opportunity to love you with all my soul. Give it to me. And Akiva saw it. And he said, oh my goodness, I, I have the opportunity. And as soon as he's, his soul leaves him, Hashem says, what does he announce? He gives out this boss call for everybody to hear. A voice came down from heaven and said, you are welcome. You are invited to the front row of the next world. By the way, all the levels that we believe that we reach on this level is the level that we will meet in the next world. Okay, so there is no synthetic reward. Like in some other religions, like your suicide bomber, you will get 40 virgins and like a waterbed in the world to come. Like that is the idea of like being a suicide bomber. Like you will get that. Or maybe it's 70 virgins, I don't know. That's their idea. That's like a synthetic reward. What is our reward? However close we get to Hashem in this <laughs> world is how close we will sit to him in the next world. Akiva made it, he's sitting right there next to Hashem. Because if all you want to do in this world is build relationships, next world, you will have that relationship. And they say, what is ultimate hell? Somebody who could not have relationships down here will be in upstairs, right, in the world to come, he'll be alone. He'll be sitting in his own room. And everybody else is going to be sitting at this dinner party with God. It actually says they'll be sitting at a dinner party, okay? And they will be sitting alone. Because if you don't know how to form relationships down here, you come up there, you'll be alone in the next world to come. There is no synthetic reward. However far you reach in this world, that is how close you will be to God in the next world. So since God is pure love, right, and we can experience it, we can experience what it means to truly connect in this world. We will ultimately be able to connect. 
Now, I just have to say it again, like total disclaimer, like Rabbi Akiva, the highest level, one of the greatest people, will never be able to reach that level. And God forbid, you should never be in a situation where you have to. But when he had the opportunity, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, you are one. Whatever you want from me, I will do. If I need to get in the car and take you to the hospital, even though I know he's faking, I'll take him to the hospital. <laughs> he was faking. He thought he was having a heart attack. It was like gas pains. I was like, you know, like you have like a gas pocket. I'm like, really? Like, I thought you were having a heart attack. And like, really? You just like, I don't know, the, the gas was like, you had a gas pocket. Like, I couldn't believe it. And then I was like, where's my level of love here? I'm not willing to do it for him. Where is your level of love? And sometimes we need like a thermometer to like check your level, like check my temperature, like where am I holding in this relationship? Do I really love this person? Do I love them because I can get what I want from them? Now I know it's late and I just wanted to end off with this idea because I always like to end off with something concrete. We come here with three essential relationships. That's what we're here for. Between us and ourselves, okay, between me and like we want to be healthy people. So we just want to make sure that everything going on in here is okay. Soul and body, right? We want our soul and body to have a, a good relationship between us and other people, okay? Whether that be a husband, a wife, a boss, parents, children. And lastly, the highest level between us and Hashem. So how do we fall in love? How can we create love? Now the Torah says something very interesting. The Torah says, You shall love your neighbor like yourself, right? And I'm always like confused, like, how can I love my neighbor like I love myself? Like, first of all, do I really love myself? And then secondly, I'm like, I spend so much time with myself. Like, nobody even spends as much time as I spend with myself. Like, even Ellie Mouth doesn't spend as much time with me as I spend with me, right? How am I going to love somebody like I love myself? So now there's a commandment that says, the you, have to, you have to love your neighbor like yourself. That's a pretty bold statement for the Torah to be able to say that. How am I going to create this love? Now there's this amazing parable of somebody walking over to a pregnant woman, okay? So now when, God willing, when you're all pregnant, um, in the right time, Mishra Atoba, people walk around, touch your belly all the time. Oh, that's so cute. What are you having? A boy, a girl, right? People are always asking questions like, oh, how many months along are you? I'm like, I don't even know you. Like, we're in the mall, right? Um, if you know me, yes, please come over to me. I'd love to tell you everything. Um, but if I don't, it's a little awkward, right? So people come over to me and they're like, are you going to love that baby? Are you going to love that baby? So I look at the lady and I'm like, are you serious? Like, what are you talking about? What if your baby's funny looking? Right? Or what if your child is not a good athlete? Or what if they're not as pretty as you as your husband? Or what if your child doesn't do well in school? What if the neighbor's kid is way better than your kid? You're going to look at the lady. You're gonna, I'm going to punch out the lady. That's what I'm going to do. I'm like, who are you? Who do you think you are? Why? Why are parents, or I mean women especially because they're carrying the baby, why are parents so committed to love their unborn child? Truthfully, they never met them. They don't know what they look like, but they have like really cool 3D sonograms right now where you can see like your baby like talking to you, right? How, would you, how do you know you're going to love your unborn child? Because when people commit to a relationship, the love is created. If people commit to get married and then have this child, they are going to love this child no matter what. So now the question is always like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? Like, I mean, I always want to know, how do you fall in love with somebody? How do you know? How do you know that that's the right person for you, right? And then we have the world that totally corrupts our views. I'm not getting into that because, like, <laughs> that just totally messes you up. But what's the idea? The more I commit, guess what? The more I commit, the more I will love that child. That's how it works. The more I commit to love my husband, to love God, the more I know I will get out of that relationship. Because I commit to you, I could fall upon you in times of need, right? So then something amazing happens. I am connected, I committed, I connected, and now I can identify with that child, the child I never met, right? I never saw, I never, I never met my kids before. I accept them no matter what, believe me, they give me heartaches, I'm not gonna lie, right? But as soon as I am, as soon as I'm presented with that child, no matter what, I committed to it. That's it. That's mine. I am going to love it. Same thing when the Jewish people accepted the Torah, right? In two weeks' time, Shavuos is coming. God's going to give us the Torah. What did we say? We said, Naaseh v'nishma. We will do and we will listen. Wait, 
we should listen first. Let me hear what's in there, and then I'll do it. No, God, you missed it. I already committed to you. I'm going to accept that Torah. I committed, and now I will listen. I will do it no matter what. Same exact principle. We commit and we understand. So now the fourth principle of God's awareness is what? Ahavas Hashem, to love Hashem, no matter what. And by committing, by going all the way, we can reach levels like Rabbi Akiva. We can reach that ultimate, real level of love. And we can fully, fully love God once we commit to him. Any questions? That's it? Are you all thinking about it? I heard this amazing thing. Um, I'll just tell you about, about when you truly love somebody. It says that um, if you try to, like, think of somebody, try to think of some, somebody that you love. Like, it doesn't have to be a guy. It could be a grandma, right? Okay, just think, right? If, I'm a, if I ask you something, by the way, um, anybody, you guys were walking around yesterday. It was Mother's Day. You met somebody. If I remind you about the speaker, right? Let's say somebody was at the JC last night. I remind you of the speaker. You try to think of that person, right? You can picture them. You see their eyes, their nose, their mouth. You're like, oh, yeah, he had a funny nose. He was bothering me the whole time while he was speaking, right? If you think, though, of a person that you know that you love and you try to picture their face, it says you can't picture their face. You can't. You try to, like, get their eyes, their facial expressions. You can't picture. Why? Because when you love somebody so much, you see right past who they really are, who their face is, and you look into their eyes. You see their soul. When you love somebody so much, you can't even picture their face because all you see is this light. You look right past their face, right past all their facial expressions to who they really are. So it actually says, when people say, like, how am I supposed to love God? Like, I can't picture him. I don't know what he looks like. I keep seeing wings. I keep seeing Hercules. I keep seeing, like, Zeus, right? Like, I, I, can't, I can't picture God. And the truth is, you don't have to picture him because just think of somebody that you love so much, you can't necessarily... <coughs> Pin it down. Same thing with God. You love him so much, you don't have to. Well, first of all, you're not allowed to carve any like imagery. That's like one of the ideas of idolatry. We can't put a face to God. We can't even give him like humanistic features. I mean, sometimes we say God's hand and things like that, but you can't picture him. It doesn't mean you, you don't need to picture their physical appearances in order to really know that you love them. Okay. That's it. I'm done. No questions? I was like, I should really make this class short because people are going to have a lot of questions about love and Rabbi Akiva. <laughs> okay, so next week is fearing God. Um, if you have any questions, we'll talk after. Okay, thank you.